All right. Well, once again, we are so thankful that you're here. We're glad that you've chosen to come and be a part of, of Calvary Bible Church this morning. Uh, those of you who came out to the early service, you, you, you braved it a little bit. Um, one of the churches that I used to pastor, their first service, their sunrise service, was starting at 5.45 in the morning today. Uh, that's in Arizona, and the sun comes up a little bit earlier there. Um, I'm glad I'm not there, let's just say that. I, uh, I, I would have slept through that service. Uh, I may have been preaching, but I probably would have been asleep during the entire service. Um, one thing, if everybody would take that little tear off, would you tear that out for us, fill it out for us, drop that in the offering plate when it comes rolling around here in just a little bit. Let us know how we can be praying for you. And then also, if you're a first-time guest, on our information table in the back is a book called Begin. And this is just our free gift to you, our way of saying thank you for coming and thank you for being a part of Calvary Bible Church this morning. If you're a first-time guest and you fill out that uh, slip for us, we've got, a, we've got a, just a small gift we'd like to send you in the mail. Not going to put you on any kind of mailing list or anything like that. You're not going to get a letter from me every single week uh, reminding you that Calvary Bible Church is here and that you should be here and nowhere else. I'm not going to do that to you, okay? I promise. Uh, you're going to get one letter from me with just a small gift in there. Just our way of saying, once again, thank you for coming uh, and taking of your time and being a part of, of Calvary Bible Church. 2,000 years ago, the power of God was reflected in a single life with such a clear demonstration of might and energy that all of human history was forever changed, culminating in the rising of that life physically from the dead. And through the resurrection of Jesus, God demonstrated his ultimate power because there's no greater power on earth than power over death. But now what? In our world today, now what? What does this mean for us right here, right now? What does it mean for us? Well, the Bible tells us that the very same power that raised Jesus Christ from the grave is the exact same power that is available to all of us today. Look at it there. It's in your notes. If, if you've got a worship floor and you came in, which everybody should have, go ahead and pull out those notes. You can follow along with me on the screens. You can follow along with me in, in, in your notes there and everything else. There's a couple blanks, not too much there today. But look at Ephesians there because this is the same power we have today. And here's what it says. You need to understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. Now the word for power there in your notes, I put this in your, in your notes here. The word for power is the word dunamis in the Greek language, which we know that the, that, that the New Testament was written in, originally was written in the Greek language. And it's the word dunamis, and it's where we get our word dynamite from. It's the same word used when referring to the power of Jesus that happens behind all of those miracles. And as we just read, the power that raised him from the dead. That's some power if you think about it. And the Bible says that that power is there for you today. Now I want you to think about it. I want you to think about it. That means that the power that resurrected Jesus can resurrect your life too. You've probably heard about the physical aspect of, of, of that before, that physical death isn't the final word, that we can look forward to being resurrected from de the dead, spending eternity w with God in heaven if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But that's not the only kind of resurrection that that verse is talking about. That's not the only kind of application of the resurrection power that the Bible would put forward. You see, you can also be resurrected to life now. You can be resurrected from the dead now, spiritually, while you're still walking on this planet. God can take your life, and no matter where you are, and no matter where you've been, He can bring you to life from a lifeless life. He can give you whatever new beginning you need. The power that coursed through the veins of Jesus, that power that raised him from the dead, can bring you back to life as well. Look at Romans 6. Here's what the Bible says. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. So why aren't we? Why aren't we living new lives? Why are some of us right here, right now, living dead lives? Why are we still dead? 
why do we live lifeless? Well, just because power exists doesn't mean that power is applied. Power that's used, power that's taken. But even more to the point, just because life is available doesn't mean you're resurrected when you're dead. Because you haven't allowed the risen Jesus to bring you back to life again. You haven't allowed him to come in and change you in the first place. And you probably know in your life, you probably know what killed you. Now, some of you are here right now and you were invited by a friend. Maybe you haven't darkened the doors of a church in years and you feel very far from God, but hey, you know, whatever, it's Easter Sunday. It's what you do, right? We go to church. And so you come. Maybe to do somebody a favor, maybe more timidly, you're kind of putting your toes in the water, but you don't feel spiritually alive and you probably know why. You probably know why. You probably know what killed you. There's two, way, two ways that most people die spiritually. And it's interesting to me because that's exactly what the resurrected Jesus dealt with almost immediately after he rose from the grave. He went to two people who were both spiritually dead in different ways, but in these two people, Jesus went to them and he says, I'm going to deal with why you're dead. And I want you to deal with why you're dead. And in so doing, he dealt with the way that so many of us are dead. The first way a lot of us die is because of doubt. The second way that a lot of us die is because of colossal, epic failure. And Jesus dealt with both. And let's see how. Number one, there he notes, rising to life from doubt. Rising to life from doubt. And let's start with doubt. One of the first people Jesus went to after his resurrection was the man by the name of Thomas. And you might have heard about this guy. He kind of gets a bad rap in the Bible. Doubting Thomas is what we've dubbed him, you know. Doubting Thomas, kind of a bad rap. Thomas wanted to believe. He just struggled with it like many of us do, right? He was actually one of Jesus' most intimate followers. And he was fiercely loyal to Jesus. There are scenes in the Bible where Thomas made it clear that he was willing to die with Jesus and for Jesus if that's where the journey was to take them. Thomas was just authentic about his struggles and his questions. Particularly when the ups and downs and the twists and turns of life brought all of this stuff to the surface. And that happens to a lot of us. And I think a lot of us appreciate the authenticity like that. We go through a tough time, a tragedy, a setback, a crisis, and suddenly we re-examine everything in life. We ask, where is God? Why didn't he come through for me? This, all, all of this God stuff, it just doesn't make any sense at all. And sometimes it makes our faith stronger. But sometimes it make us, makes us go back and question some of the most foundational truths that we've believed, believed and maybe held for most of our lives. Most of us, we keep it to ourselves, or we stuff it down, right? Not Thomas. You see, Thomas was up front with it. In the worst moment of his life, the one that created the most questions, the most fear, the most anxiety, was Jesus dying. It was as if, as if everything he believed Everything he had managed to trust was ripped away because for him, it wasn't just the death of Jesus, but it was the end of Jesus. That was all Thomas could see. That was it. There was no resurrection that he could see coming. Jesus was just another man, maybe a prophet, but no Savior, no Messiah, no Lord, because he doubted that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Have you killed Jesus in your life like that? You see, I think a lot of people have. Some people had Jesus killed when they were young. You know, a father and mother told them about Christianity, but when they looked and saw how, how little their parents actually practiced it, how little it actually meant in their lives, they just walked away because it was irrelevant to my parents. Why would it be relevant to me? 
Some people had Jesus killed when they got involved in the church and they saw the hypocrisy of the church. Not for me. Some people had Jesus killed when they tested spiritual things, but then they ran into a bunch of of legalistic Christians who put demand after demand after demand after demand on them, and they just walked away from it all. Broken. Some, like Thomas, just saw things, experienced things that made believing in all of this Jesus stuff kind of hard. He had unanswered questions and he had unanswered doubts. And so he died and Jesus died in him. Author Dan Brown wrote arguably one of the best-selling books ever in the, in, in the last few centuries, The Da Vinci Code. Most of you have either read the book or you've seen the movie. And at first glance, the plot of this book or this movie isn't anything that, that isn't the plot of almost every book and movie that's out there. The murder of a curator at a museum in Paris that leads to a trail of clues found in the work of Leonardo da Vinci and to the discovery of the centuries-old ancient secret society. But as the plot unfolds, we find woven throughout the narrative a thoroughgoing rejection of the truth of the Christian faith. Specifically, Brown suggests that the church invented the deity of Christ, the deity of Jesus. So it wasn't just a novel, was it? Brown put forward a blend of fiction and historical assertion that suggests that the entire foundation upon which Christianity is established is false. In an interview to promote a a later book, he was asked, it's clear you have an interesting relationship with religion. What is it? Are you religious? Here was his answer. I was raised Episcopalian and I was very religious as a kid. Then in 8th grade or ninth grade, whatever, I studied astronomy, cosmology, and the origins of the universe. And I remember saying to the minister, I-, I don't get it. I read a book that said that there was an explosion known as the Big Bang, but here it says that God created the heavens and the earth. Which is it? And unfortunately, the response I got was, nice boys don't ask that question. And a light went off, and I said, the Bible doesn't make sense. Science makes much more sense to me, and I just gravitated away from religion. Is that how you feel? Is that how you feel? That when it comes to Jesus, doubt is off limits, that questions aren't allowed, which makes belief hard and skepticism very easy? You see, that was Thomas. Three days after his crucifixion, Jesus presented himself to some of the disciples, resurrected from the dead, but Thomas, he wasn't there. So they went and they told Thomas all about it. And this is what he said in John. He says, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands. Put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. So what happened? One of the first people Jesus went to after the resurrection was Thomas. And their interaction is absolutely riveting. Let me read it for you. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. This time Thomas was with them, the doors were locked, but suddenly Jesus was standing among them. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe my Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. I love that scene, don't you? I love that scene. Jesus appears and turns immediately to Thomas. Nobody else, Thomas. But not to condemn him. Not to say, Thomas, were you really going to bail on me? I mean, what's the matter with you? But to say, Thomas, Thomas, I'm big enough for your doubt. I'm big enough for your questions. Here I am, Thomas. Check me out. And he did. And in the end, Thomas believed. I wish I could go back to that young Dan Brown. After suing that minister for spiritual malpractice, I would have taken that little guy aside and I would have said, hey, there's no bad questions. There's no bad questioners. Let's talk about cosmology. The Bible does say that God created the world and in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And really, if you follow science, it's right in line. 
all the Bible says is that God did it and it was good. So keep asking your questions and keep getting your answers. If this is true, if Jesus was who he said he was, then it will stand up to any amount of intellectual scrutiny. So folks, listen, you don't have to check your brains at the door. When you come to church, when you come to God, you don't have to check your brains at the door. No question should ever be off limits. That's one thing we we talk about here all the time. Bring your questions. I can't even guarantee you I'll answer them all. But we'll try. And we can have conversations. And we can try to alleviate your doubt. Try to answer your questions that you have maybe about God. Maybe about life. No question should be considered off limits. But you see, that's not just what I would say to an eighth grade boy. It's what I would say to all of you today. Because it's what Jesus would say to you. Just like he said to Thomas. He went to a man who had questions and Jesus had answers. But that isn't the only way that we feel spiritually dead in our lives, is it? In fact, A lot of our doubts can be the smokescreen for something else, something deeper, something that we like to kind of keep hidden, and it's our failures. Number two, rising to life from failure. Rising to life from failure. The ways maybe we've messed up, dropped the ball, betrayed our integrity, went against what we knew was right and true, those times we sinned. And there's nothing that can make us feel more spiritually dead than that. A divorce, a DWI, an abortion, an arrest, having an affair, knowing you dropped the ball as a parent, stealing, lying, cheating. Do you feel alive after that? Do you really feel alive after that? No. You see, I know how you feel because I feel the same way. We feel dead. The last thing you want to do is be around anything that reminds you of how dead you feel. So Jesus dies then too. But did you know that Jesus wants to bring us to life there too? In fact, most of all. And we see that in another person he went to right after he had been been crucified. Right after he raised from the dead. Jesus went to a man by the name of Peter. If you've ever been to church in any way, shape, or form, you've heard of Peter. Peter was one of the most intimate, trusted followers of Jesus. He had been personally called by Jesus to come and follow, and he had. In fact, Peter spent three years with Jesus, by his side, listening and learning from his teaching, witnessing his miracles, watching every move that Jesus made, being personally molded, mentored, developed into this life of integrity, this life of impact, this life of significance for three years. Jesus even gave him a new name. When we first meet Peter in the Bible, his name is Simon. Later on, Jesus changes it to Peter, which means the rock. And Jesus is saying, hey, Peter, on you, I can actually build something. We can do something. Then on the last night he would ever spend with Jesus, Jesus pulled Peter off to the side and said, hey, Peter, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be taken. I'm going to be crucified. But Peter, you need to listen to me, and I want you to listen real close, Peter. I'm going to rise again. I'm going to come back to life after three days. He told Peter to take heart, to not lose faith as those events began to unfold, to stand strong, that the others would need his leadership, that the others would need his courage, that the others would need his strength. And Peter, like any of us probably would have, what does he say? You can count on me, Jesus. You can count on me. I'm not going to do anything. Yeah, I'm going to be there with you, Jesus. I'm going to go everywhere with you. I would lay down my life for you, Jesus. And then Jesus looked Peter in the eyes and he said, what if I told you, what if I told you, Peter, that before the dawn comes, before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to disown me three times. Peter was stunned. What? What? And you can imagine that he even resolved deep inside of himself, I'm not going to do it. You know what that's like, don't you? You've been there. Someone says, this is the road you're going to go down. 
If you continue to go down this road, this is where it's going to lead. And you go, not me. And you resolve in your heart. You resolve in your life that it's not going to be you. And then in a landslide of events that unfolded, with blinding intensity and speed, Jesus was betrayed by Judas, arrested and taken to the authorities. And here's what happened next. It's in your notes. Simon Peter followed along behind, as did another of the disciples. The other disciple was acquainted with the high priest, so he was allowed to enter the courtyard with Jesus. Peter stood outside the gate. Then the other disciple spoke to the woman watching at the gate, and she let Peter in. The woman asked Peter, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? No, he said, I am not. The guards and the household servants were standing around a charcoal fire they had made because it was cold. And Peter stood there with them, warming himself. As Simon Peter was standing by the fire, they asked him again, aren't you one of his disciples? I am not, he said. But one of the household servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus? Again, Peter denied it and immediately a rooster crowed. Folks, listen, no matter what you've done, what you've experienced, I can't imagine a more total and complete failure than that. I can't imagine it. It wasn't just a moral failure. It was a complete spiritual breakdown. Everything his life had been about Everything that he had committed himself to, pledged himself to, was renounced in a single night. And not just once, but three times. Some rock, huh? Have you ever done something that you knew was wrong? Knew you shouldn't have done? Ever vowed that you would never do it again and then you did? It's one of the sickest feelings in human existence, isn't it? And Peter felt it. He had totally, utterly messed up and had dropped about as far off of God's dream team as anybody could. Well, everything else that Jesus had said would happen began to happen too. Jesus was crucified, he was buried, and on the third day, on that very first Easter Sunday morning, the stone had been rolled away and the body was gone. And then word came. People started seeing Jesus alive and well. But where did that leave Peter? I mean, where did that leave Peter? What would happen when he saw Jesus now? He knew, he knew what he deserved. Complete rejection, even eternal damnation. But he also knew what he longed for. That somehow, some way, it could all be forgiven. That he could somehow, some way, still be accepted and loved. That there was a second chance. But then he probably thought to himself, but there's no way. There's no way. Not after what I've done. How could there be anything worse, more contemptible than what I just did? I denied Jesus himself over and over again. So what did Peter do? He did what a lot of us do. He gave up. He gave up. Jesus was through with him. So he knew that he was just going to have to be through with Jesus. So according to the Bible, he left it all spiritually. Peter went back to the thing he knew how to do. The thing where he first met Jesus. Which was fishing. Because that's what Peter had been. He'd been a fisherman. In fact, that's what he was doing when he first met Jesus. It was an interesting first meeting. Peter wasn't catching anything, so Jesus, who who Peter had just met, he says, take me out with you. Peter was seasoned in his trade. He was out there all day, but they weren't biting. He just wasn't catching anything. He tried to tell Jesus that, but Jesus said, hey, Peter, here's what I want you to do. This time, I want you to put the net over here. And I'm sure Peter was thinking, yeah, Jesus, put the net over there. You got screw loose? Told you this. I'm sure Peter Peter thought, let me show you where to put that net right now, Jesus. But Peter humored that guy. He humored him, didn't he? He got out of the boat and he got in the water and Jesus said, throw your nets here. And Peter did. And the nets couldn't even hold all that they had caught. And Peter's first reaction, suddenly aware that he was in the presence of someone or something related to God, was to say, 
go away from me. I am a sinful man. And while it was true, Jesus was like Peter was, like all of us. He was a moral failure. He was a moral mess up, a man of sin. And Jesus didn't go away. Jesus simply said, Peter, I want you to follow me. And Peter did. But now that Peter had abandoned Jesus, and he knew that Jesus would never want anything else to do with him, he went back to what he knew, fishing. And some of the other disciples went along with him, probably hoping that they could bring Peter back from all of this. But here's what happened next. At dawn, the disciples saw Jesus standing on the beach, but they couldn't see who he was. He called out, friends, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get plenty of fish. So they did. And they couldn't draw on the net because there were so many fish in it. Then John said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he jumped into the water and swam ashore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to shore for they were only about 300 feet out. When they got there, they saw that a charcoal fire was burning and fish were frying over it and there was bread. Now, I want to stop right there. Did you catch that it was almost the exact same meeting that Peter had with Jesus in the first place? In the first place, Peter out fishing, not catching anything. And then this stranger comes and says, try to put it on the other side of the boat. And Peter does. And a miracle occurs and the net becomes filled with all of these fish. Was Jesus saying that there could be a second chance here? Is that what Jesus was saying? Jesus had already reached out and touched his life once. Could Jesus want anything to do with him now? And then, when he got to Jesus, did you notice what was going on there? Jesus was standing around a charcoal fire. The same kind of fire that Peter had stood around when he denied Jesus. It's really the most vivid reminder imaginable of Peter's failure. It's almost like Jesus was saying, let's gather around this charcoal fire again and see if we can come out with a different scenario. What did Jesus say to complete, utter, moral failure? Let's find out. It's in your notes. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. Once more he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Interesting question, isn't it? Do you love me? You see, that was Jesus' agenda. Now, what are you thinking? Now, are you sorry for what you've done, Peter? No, but do you promise to never let it happen again? But do you love me? Do you love me? As New Testament scholar Murray Harris put it, first things first. You see, God loves us. No matter how much failure we bring to the table, the real issue is, do we love him? You see, that's what comes first. If you think Jesus is more interested in your train wrecks than your heart, you're wrong. You're wrong. His biggest concern, no matter what you've done in your life, is this. Are you going to be in relationship with me? Are you going to love me? And are you going to let me love you? Jesus is wanting Peter to know that God is the God of second chances and not only second chances, but third chances and fifth chances and 100 chances. And God wants to forgive us and God wants to forgive all of you. And God wants to be close to us and God wants to accept us beginning right here with our failure. With our failure and all. But do we want to be that close to God? You say, if that's the kind of God he is, then yes, well, he is. He is. That's why he went to Peter. And he wants to come to you and he wants to offer you the same thing. To come to him as a failure. To come to him with your doubts and start over. And let new life come where there's been nothing but death. That's Easter, folks. That's what this whole weekend is about. If you've ever thought to yourself, Jesus rose from the dead, so what? Well, now you know. He came back to life to bring you to life. Even if you've been dying from doubt and you've been dying from failure, you can be raised from that death if you want to be. 
you have to put your finger in his hands. You have to put your hand into the wound on his side and believe. And when he says, do you love me, say yes, I do. And you can be resurrected. And then you'll know what the celebration of this weekend is really all about. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for the risen Christ. And that, Father, life wouldn't even be possible without the risen Savior. And that, Father, you bring us to life through our doubts, through our failures just like you did with Thomas and just like you did with Peter. And Father, I'm sure that they thought that Jesus was crazy at times. But they still followed him. But then when he died, it seemed like life was over. It seemed like everything they had been doing had fallen apart. Maybe that's where you're at this morning in your life. Maybe your life seems like it's in total shambles from doubt, from failure, whatever it is. For most of us, I think it's failure. We feel like we're utter and complete failures before Jesus, and that's the reason why we can't come to him. How could he forgive me of all those things I've done? How could he do that? And yet Jesus says, I'll forgive you. I even forgave the guy who denied me three times in front of everybody, and I forgave him. I can forgive you too. If you're sitting here today and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you've never come into that loving relationship with Jesus, and Jesus is calling to you right now and saying, do you love me? Do you love me? And maybe today, for the first time in your life, you're ready to say yes. You're ready to say yes. And if that's you, would you follow me? Just quietly in your heart, just you and God. You see, the Bible says that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's a promise of Scripture. That all we have to do is call on Jesus' name and we will be given eternal life in heaven with him. If that's you, would you just pray with me? Just say, Father, I need your son, Jesus. And right now, I'm asking him to come into my life to save me from all of my sins. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus, who died for my doubt, who died for my failure, so that I could be raised to life, come alive, and have eternal life with you. If you just prayed that prayer, would you just take that little tear off? Would you mark that box that says, I'm committing my life to Christ? We're excited for you. We want to help you on this journey of knowing and growing in your relationship with Jesus Christ because, listen, it's a journey. And we're here to help you along the way. Bring your questions, bring your doubts. God, we thank you so much for this morning you've given us. We thank you for this time that we can be here.